Okay, uh, for tonight, uh, Psalm 32. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. So this... This is wonderful. Um, I actually may have read this in Romans before I ever read it in Psalm 32, because the Apostle Paul loves, you know, loves to quote um, Old Testament scripture, which I think is great. Um, anytime you have, um, obviously, Jesus did it in the Gospels, he would quote, you know, scripture as well. Um, and almost said it's really edifying, you know, when you when you read it that way, at least it is for me. Mm -hmm. Um but this this here really is a, a great description. Um, only the believer can know this, you know, um, and it's and it's really I, I want to say it's New New Testament salvation, but it's salvation for all times. Right. Because we read in Hebrews that the Old Testament believers were saved in exactly the same way. And I think uh, Paul also covered that in Romans. In Romans, Paul tells us that the, um, that it was credited back you know, to the, to the saints of the old Testament. So Adam and Eve, um, Abel would, would be saved in the same way. Now that's by Jesus Christ, right? His, his death, um, on the cross on our behalf, his resurrection. Um, and so, uh, you see the substitute substitutionary, um, uh, part of it in verse two, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's gotta be imputed to somebody. Right. It has to be punished in some way. And again, that's that's, you know, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, and you have the you have the psalmist in verse three and four. Um, just having having the worst time. Right. And, you know, we look at Psalm 51 and I, and I don't and I don't think I don't think this was happening to him in Psalm 51, because I think he was on top of the world. King David was on top of the world in his sin right until nathan the prophet came to him that you're you know you're that man that that, mm -hmm. that stole the you know that stole the lamb from you know from the the poor family um but this is you know this is keeping sin and it's not confessing it it's being stubborn um but look at the guilt i mean have you ever you ever done that you know where you fall into sin and you don't you can't enjoy it the way you did when you were unbelieving when you were unbelieving you were mostly ignorant about it, but when, you know, as a believer, um, you, you're realizing that you're offending a holy God. And so mm -hmm. how could, you know, how could you enjoy it? I think that's what you see the psalmist going through here. King David. Then he said, I acknowledge my sin to you in verse five and my, and my iniquity or my sin, I did not hide. And I said, I will confess my transgressions or sin to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So, and yet to be forgiven of the guilt, you know, of our sins <clears throat> is something only the Lord can give. Um, verse six, this is kind of a scary uh, verse, right? In verse six, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Um, so I don't know if this describes calling, like someone's being called um, or if it, suggest there's a time when when god can't be found so i don't and i don't know if this just describes the believer um and maybe god's going to lead him to a sin i'm not sure well that's what i got brothers i love this verse two verse one to Bless is the whom transgression forgiven, whose sin is covered. 
and blessed is the man to whom the Lord does impute iniquity, and in whom spirit there is no deceit. Who are blessed people are who are forgiven of sin. When that, that's what Apostle Paul he quoted in the Romans chapter four, the imputation, right? He imputed we all are righteous because God forgave our sin, past and present and future. We all are righteous. We all are forgiven our sin. But one thing in here, when I say one thing, in Psalm number fifty one. There is consequent sin is so also there. God forgave the sin of David with Bathsheba, right? That consequent also there. And once again, you see, not only one time, right? In the last, right? He counted the census, right? And that's one also. He just fried and he just counted in census in Chronicle. And then because of the sin, the result, the old the people of Israel, they fight. You know, yeah, some people that feel so guilty about the sins they've committed that they don't think they can be forgiven. And um, like verse 2 says, what joy for those who record the Lord has cleared them of their guilt. <clears throat> um, and in verse 5, finally I confess all my sins to you and you stop trying to I stop trying to hide my guilt. So a lot of people, you know, don't think that they that God can forgive them. Um, and they do hold that burden. Well, that's a good scripture for that. I was saying that in verse verse three in the NLT says, "When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away." <laughs> And I groaned all day long. When I refused to confess my sin, it takes us back to the verse that um, for the thing I talked about earlier, James chapter 5, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Perhaps the guilt is all there because perhaps they haven't confessed their sin. You know, there's a couple of examples. In the, remember, Jesus said, I don't know where it's at, but he mentioned, he, 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 he said two people were forgiven. One was forgiven a, a ton of a, a ton of debt, and one was forgiven less debt. And he says, "Who would be more appreciative of the person that was forgiven a ton of debt?" And here, King David understands forgiven a ton of debt, but the Lord brought up uh, Romans. I think it's Romans chapter four. We had just read this. We went at church on on Sunday, so I, it, you know, talking about faith, the faith of Abraham, saved by faith. Chapter four of Romans says Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deed had made him acceptable to God, he would have been something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us that Abraham believed God, and God accounted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but it's something that they have earned. People are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who declare righteous without working for it. Oh, the joys of those whose sins are forgiven. We're so joyful because we have been forgiven of something that we... What did you say here? We... Um, because there's because of their faith, God has forgiven sinners. David describes happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. So here we are, you know, with all this sin, and now we're declared righteous, not because of anything we did, but because something Jesus did for us. And why would we not be joyful? We were deserving of death, and now we're given life. When Lauren was talking, it kind of reminded me of the Lord's Supper. Like you were just going, you were talking about how the Lord Jesus has done this for us. And it just reminded me of what Jesus has done. And I'm like thinking to myself, okay, let's grab the bread. Let's grab some wine here. It's, 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 let's celebrate the Lord, what the Lord has done for us. 
He has forgiven us of our sins. We're cleansed because of what he has done. Why wouldn't we be joyful? I know we always say that in this group that we ought to be the most joyful people on planet Earth. And we should be because our sins have been forgiven. Yeah, the um, the way the way that you were describing, um, you know how uh, how it's a free gift. You know, we we were looking a little bit at um, at verse two, um, the whole idea that it's um, like, you know the fact of the uh, of the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a free gift, um, and not by anything that we've done. And so think about those two things, the free gift, nothing that I've done, but something that he's done. Mm -hmm. um, it really, that's something that's um, opposite of, of what the, what the world would, uh, would understand, right? Because when you're unbelieving, the only thing you understand is doing yeah. every, everything that you, that's, you know, that you ever got. Like, like let, let's say you earned it. You worked really hard. You probably been always been of the mind. I was always, well, you know, I got that. I did that. You know, if I did something good on the house. I did that. Right. That's mine. You know, that's, that, that's my house. That's my mortgage, you know, and just a puffed up, you know, prideful kind of thing. And then the scripture says, well, no, it's, it's, it's something that's free. It's something you don't pay for. It's something you don't do. It's something that's done to you. You're taken out of something, out of out of one life. You're put into another life. You get new life, completely. It just doesn't. It, it just doesn't make sense. You know, it's it's First Corinthians one eighteen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, "I will destroy the wisdom of the wise." And the cleverness of the clever, I will set aside. And, you know, the great philosophers um, will, will say that the word of the cross is, is nonsense, it's ridiculous. Um, and then even more, um, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Um, well, let me go back. Okay, that's uh, right. First Corinthians two twelve. Um, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Salvation, you know, the Holy Spirit, God's word, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So, not in words taught by human wisdom. So, you know, very often, you know, you, you may hear um, critics of the Bible or these so-called higher critics of the Bible that will say things like, you know, oh, well, you can't take this too literally or you can't take that too literally. But then if you hear something like that right away, they, um, they kind of uh, betray themselves, right? Because... If somebody is saying that about the Bible, they don't have the spirit of God in them. So how can they be an authority on the word of God if they don't have the spirit of God? Right. Right. Who, who's who's the ultimate? Who's the ultimate authority? It's God. You know, and we have his word. Um, so then in um, in verse 14, that a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God they are foolish to him and we cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised and so what what are the things of the spirit of god the the, the substitutionary death of jesus uh, the blood of jesus to cover our sins the resurrection of jesus uh for our justification you know god's word in in general right the natural man does not accept god's word in general um and then verse 15 says, but he who is spiritual appraises all things that he himself is appraised by no one. For, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? I think that's from Job. Um, but we have the mind of Christ, says the Apostle Paul. Verse 
Praise God. Praise God. So the natural man cannot understand uh, Psalm 32. Yes. Right. That's one of those deeply, you know, edifying mm -hmm. uh, scriptures, Psalm 51. Um, but the ones that the ones that build us up and bring us joy uh, because we understand that joy of, of being forgiven. Yep. Definitely won't know how it works until he's accepted it. That's the thing. He doesn't accept right, it. Right. Until it's happened to you, right? Right. Yeah, Psalm 51 actually was written after David uh, committed all the sins. I mean, um, adultery, murder, and um, so that's a pretty uh, powerful forgiveness there. Mm -hmm. and then uh, the Lord says, a man after his own heart. And the good thing David's life was great after that, right? I mean, it was just, it was just one big, uh, one big vacation, right? <laughs> the rest yeah. of his life. Oh, wait, no, that didn't happen. Uh, wait. Consequences. Not exactly. <laughs> yes, right. consequences. Yeah. Yeah, it is good. Whenever we study, uh, what I say that every, uh, task day, I have to teach that in Bible college that in the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. So I took many things from, I'm learning many things from, all of my brother, just I just go, I uh, record and then just teach to them today, which we have lesson also tomorrow. I'm going to uh, teach about that lesson. Mm -hmm. Chapter great. four, yeah. Romans chapter four. Amen. Yes, a great chapter. The whole the whole book of Romans is great. Yeah, brother Laura, I like the way you you talked about the world not understanding. Um, uh, uh, Psalms 32 or Romans chapter 4. This joy that we feel, I had read somewhere, I'm not sure who wrote it, but I had read something that said Philippians is considered the, the happiest book in the Bible or something like that. And then it yeah. said, yet that book was written in prison. So circumstances doesn't dictate your joy. And so here, the joy of those whose sins are forgiven. Yeah, you're right. The natural man will not understand that. Yes. You know, uh, e even even so-called churchgoers, it's, they've said to me before where you can't be happy all the time. Right. Things like that. That's because they're natural men. You're right. You just can't understand it. It's, it's, it's an unexplainable joy. The Lord puts the joy of the Lord in you. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's joy. But... You can't explain it. How can you explain Silas and, and Paul being shackled up and be full of joy in prison? It's just unexplainable. All these people going to their death and dying for Jesus. It's um, They're not natural men. You mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, Paul and Silas and, and really the believer not living by their circumstances. And that's really the opposite, right? If you, if you reverse that and you look at the world, think about, um, we, we're, I'm sure we're guilty of doing it sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. something, you know, something happens, you get a financial hit or, or this thing happens in your family or that thing happens and we can be guilty sometimes of living by our circumstances, but we're not to do that as believers, right? Because yeah. we, right. we have, we have something much greater to look to. We have Christ, right? And something much greater to look forward to. So circumstances i mean that's just it's something that's fleeting um and we shouldn't live that all right yes we don't have hope right right faith and joy they they understand, they understand joy it's they understand happiness like circumstances make you happy they don't understand the joy part of it and having hope 